Hello and welcome to the June IASB Update podcast. My name is Claire Short and I am part of the communications team at the IFRS Foundation. Today I am joined by Hans Hugevorst and Sue Lloyd, Chair and Vice Chair of the IASB respectively. And we'll be talking about topics covered at the board meeting held on the 22nd and 23rd of June 2021. We will also be saying goodbye to Hans today who finishes a decade as chair on the 30th of June. Stay tuned until the end of the episode to hear him share some of his reflections on those 10 years. But let's dive in with a topic that a lot of stakeholders are keenly interested in, IFRS 17, our insurance contract standard. This issue first appeared back on the agenda last month with a question about one-time classification differences that can arise in the comparative information that insurers will present on initial application of IFRS 17 and IFRS 9 financial instruments. Sue, can you give us a little bit more information on this question and take us through what the board decided at its June meeting? Sure. So um, recently, some insurers contacted us to let us know about some accounting mismatches that they're finding can occur between their financial assets and their insurance contract liabilities as a result of the different transition approaches in those two standards, IFRS 9 and IFRS 17. And now they're getting advanced in their implementation, they have been able to point out to us that these mismatches can be quite quite big in the comparative um, period. And these mismatches are coming about because not all financial assets are accounted for applying IFRS 9 in the comparative period. So these are uh, temporary mismatches because they would go away once you get past the comparative period. So it's just a short term issue um, and it doesn't affect all insurers, but for some, you know, it's important. So the board has been exploring possible ways to make some amendments to IFRS 17 to help with this transition issue so that the comparative information provided to investors um, on initial application of the standards can be improved. And we are proposing that the amendment would be optional and that it would be um, very much targeted at the issue to really try to prevent us disrupting the implementation processes that are already underway or and to avoid unintended consequences. So at this month's meeting, uh, we decided to go ahead and to propose a narrow scope amendment, which would give insurers the option to classify financial assets which relate to insurance contract liabilities in their comparative information in a way that aligns with how they expect those assets to be classified once they actually apply IFRS 9 to those assets. So we have added this project to our work plan and we aim to put out an exposure draft soon. Um, Because it's really important we get this done quickly to help people in their implementation of these two standards, we also agreed at this meeting that there would be a shortened comment period of 60 days on these proposals. Thank you, Sue. Hans, the board also continued its discussion from last month on feedback gathered in two recent consultations. The first of these is related to goodwill and impairment. Please, can you fill us in on what the board heard this month? Yeah, so after we uh, finished the feedback um, analysis at our May meeting, we began this month to discuss any potential changes to our preliminary views. uh, And this month we focused on the project's scope and its objective. Now, the fact is that most uh, respondents agreed with the uh, project objective and and, and, and the scope as it stands. Um, However, some said there should be a greater focus to improving the effectiveness of the impairment test and less focus to improving disclosures about uh, business combinations, which was an important part of our preliminary decisions. we, we discussed it at length and uh, we decided not to amend the scope or objective of the, the project, thinking that all these issues, um, impairment tests, uh, subsequent uh, accounting and disclosures, that they all hang together uh, and that we should look at them uh, together. So the board, um, after I leave, will continue uh, discussing uh, its preliminary views at the future meetings. I um, I took the opportunity towards the end of the uh, meeting to express a sort of a, a final wish on this uh, project. And I said, well, if we should decide uh, that we were to reintroduce um, amortization of, of goodwill, 
I sincerely hope that we will also be able to present a disclosure package because just going back to the uh, to the past with uh, reintroduction of amortization, I think in, if that were to be done by itself, uh, many would see that as a regressive step. Uh, so I hope that we will that the, the board in the future will also be able to make progress on disclosures. Thank you, Hans. Um, indeed, the topic of goodwill and impairment is going to be one of the highlights of next month's agenda when the board holds a meeting with the FASB to share updates on e each organization's current projects. Um, this meeting takes place on the 23rd of July and details will be available on ifrs.org. Turning to something that could be referred to as a passion project of yours, Hans, primary financial statements. This month, the board continued its discussion of potentially expanding the scope of the non-GAAP management performance measure requirements and the board that the board put forward in our exposure draft last year. Um, can you fill us in on what you heard this month? Yes, yeah, so indeed we uh, discussed at length um, whether we should expand the uh, requirements uh, on management performance uh, measures, also known as uh, non-GAAP measures. Um, our proposals on this would require that a company discloses how a management performance measure is calculated and that it should provide a rec reconciliation to the closest IFRS measure and, and explain why it is used. Um, there were many constituents, many stakeholders who asked us to expand the scope of this requir requirement to be broader than just the subtotals of income and expenses in the statement of financial uh, performance. Uh, while uh, many of the board members expressed sympathy uh, for uh, this uh, request, we were uh, in majority fearful that uh, this might lead to scope creep and, and might slow down the progress th that we can make uh, with this very important uh, project. So um, uh, we decided uh, not to look much further. We did decide to go ahead and expand the scope to subtotals of income and expense that a company includes in either the numerator or denominator of ratios. Let me just add one sentence. We decided uh, against expanding the scope to include measures based on the cash flow statement, statement of financial position and other items in the statement of financial performance. Again, for the reason uh, that we were worried that that would take up a lot of time and uh, unforeseen consequences uh, and that it might uh, derail the, uh, the project as it is. Thank you, Hans. Uh, every month, the board hears an update on maintenance and consistent application. As part of this update and in accordance with our updated due process requirements, the board is asked whether it objects to the finalization of agenda decisions agreed to by the IFRS Interpretations Committee. This month, the board confirmed the two agenda decisions discussed, one on the topic of costs necessary to sell inventories related to IAS2, and the other on the preparation of financial statements when equity is no longer a going concern, which relates to IAS10. You can find out more about these and other agenda decisions in the IFRIC updates, which are published on our website. And you can also tune into the Quarterly Interpretations Committee podcast, the next episode of which will be released in July. As a result of the maintenance and consistent application update, the board has decided to add two narrow scope amendment projects to its current agenda. Both of these result from previous discussions by the Interpretations Committee. Sue, can you fill us in on these, on these two projects, please? Sure. So firstly, uh, IAS1 and the classification of um, liabilities as current or non-current. So the Interpretations Committee published a uh, tentative agenda decision looking at um, the classification and focusing on the effect of some amendments to IAS1 that we finalised relatively recently. In response to that agenda decision, the committee received information about some new issues in applying those amendments that hadn't previously been brought to the board's attention. So in response to that, the board decided to undertake a narrow scope standard setting project to address some of these concerns by proposing some narrow scope amendments to how the current non-current classification would work. And this is really focusing on liabilities that are subject to 
conditions that need to be met within uh, 12 months of the reporting date. So looking at some adjustments to the classification requirements and also um, proposing some improvements to the information provided about those liabilities through presentation and disclosure. The board also agreed to propose that we delay the effective date of the um, uh, 2020 amendments by a year so that they would be effective for annual reporting periods beginning in uh, 2024. On the second narrow scope uh, standard setting project that we looked at uh, relates to supply chain financing arrangements. And some listeners might remember that the Interpretation Committee published an agenda decision on this topic recently, which I think helpfully uh, reminds people about the existing requirements that apply to supply chain financing. And I really do recommend that people look at that agenda decision because it pulls together relevant requirements particularly about how to think about what presentation and disclosure would be helpful to provide relevant information to investors. But again, when the Interpretation Committee looked at this, part of the responses that we got um, suggested that the board look at considering some additional specific requirements to improve transparency around this type of financing, because currently it can be very unclear to investors when a company's entered into these arrangements and they can have important effects on working capital and cash flows. So as I said, the board agreed to proceed with a narrow scope project to look at disclosures concerning quantitative information and key terms and conditions about these types of arrangements to help investors really understand the balance sheet and cash flow effects. Thank you, Sue. Uh, that wraps up our discussions from the June board meeting, but there are just a few other pieces of news that I want to bring to your attention. The first of these relates to the IFRS Foundation trustees ongoing project on sustainability. On the 7th of July, three of our trustees will be hosting a live webinar event to discuss the latest developments in their work on a proposed new sustainability standards board. They will also be taking questions from the audience and you can find out more information, including how to register for either a morning or afternoon session on our website at ifrs.org forward slash sustainability. We'd also like to tell you about a digital content survey that the Foundation is currently running. We're inviting all of you to take part in the survey and to take 15 minutes out of your day to answer a few questions on the kind of content you'd like to see us share on our online platforms. These platforms include our website, our social, channel, social channels and indeed this podcast. The survey is open until the 23rd of July and we will be using the data collected to inform our future content strategy. You will find a link to the survey on the new section of our website, ifres.org. And that brings us to a farewell. As mentioned at the top of this episode, Hans will be finishing as chair of the board at the end of June, and he'll be handing over the reins to his successor, Andreas Barco, who will also take over Hans's role on this podcast. Hans, you've steered the ship that is the IASB through some interesting times over the past decade. Um, and I know this one is always a hard question to answer because narrowing it down is so difficult. But what has been one of the key highlights for you? Well, in terms of the standard setting, I see actually three highlights. Um, first of all, the uh, leasing standard, uh, which was an important standard because it really improved the insight in the balance sheet uh, and also a better income statement for uh, investors. Um, it was a, a, a standard with a lot of political opposition against it because uh, it was costly to do, but especially a, a lot of people engaged in leasing to alleviate the, uh, the the balance sheet and that would no longer be possible. Uh, I, I like the outcome. Uh, it is one of the purest standards that we uh, made in terms of very little compromise in it. Uh, it gives a clear answer and I still find that a, a, a minor miracle how we got that done because during the standard setting process we, we did explore um, compromises ended up deciding that doesn't work and uh, ended up with this pure standard which uh, now nobody complains about anymore. Uh, then secondly, of course, the insurance standard, uh, which is still to be effective, uh, but which is done and uh, which is just a vast improvement over current practice in the world, which is highly divergent and often extremely poor uh, quality. So that's another uh, highlight. And the third highlight is the standard that we uh, just discussed uh, on, on performance uh, reporting, uh, primary financial statements, 
uh, I believe that is going to be um, fulfilling the wishes of many investors in terms of giving much better structure to the income statement uh, and more reliable information. So uh, those are the three uh, highlights in terms of uh, standard setting. In terms of the position of IFRS in the world, um, I, I think we have succeeded in really consolidating uh, IFRS as a leading global standard uh, in accounting. Um, when I took over, um, it soon became clear that um, uh, the United States would not be adopting uh, IFRS and many people were afraid that uh, that might lead to a disintegration of the world of IFRS and the opposite has happened. Uh, many more countries have joined in uh, Asia and in Africa. Japan, uh, in Japan, uh, the country of voluntary adoption, many, many companies uh, have started using uh, IFRS soon. Uh, more than half of Japanese companies will be using IFRS. Uh, so I think that is a, a really big success. Uh, it's really unthinkable that uh, the world of IFRS will disintegrate anymore. Um, and Hans, I know you've said to me before that one of the things you've enjoyed most about um, being chair of the board is the opportunity you've had to travel the world, to meet stakeholders in their jurisdictions and to have conversations face to face with them and and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so do you, have you kept a record of how many countries you visited? Yes, but the last, I haven't counted them in a long time, um, <laughs> but I think it must be uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 jurisdictions, uh, countries that I have visited over time. Some of them uh, before, obviously, uh, before I became chair of the ISB, but um, in my chairmanship, I've been able to um, to to add a lot and, and, and uh, you know, countries like Bangladesh and Nepal, countries where you would not easily come uh, without this job. And I've uh, Ecuador in uh, Latin America, uh, Colombia. Uh, so uh, that has been truly, I mean, it has been extremely tiring physically. It was obvious, uh, often very difficult with all the accumulation of jet lags that you go through. But I enjoyed it immensely. It gave me so much energy to see all these people in all these parts of the world working towards the common goal of good accounting. Uh, so, yes, that was great. And I guess the question that a lot of people have been asking you is, do you have any ideas on what's next? No, not really, because, uh, you know, uh, our independence rules are very strict. Uh, so I've not been able to look for a new job in, 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 the, in the last year. Um, and uh, uh, so that will have to uh, show itself in the in, in the next couple of months. My career has taken so many unexpected turns that I really don't dare to predict what it's what it is that I'm going to do, except that I am going to continue working. I still fit and still very young, 65. These days to become president of the United States, you must be deeply into your 70s. So, um, uh, you know, um, I, I will continue working for uh, many years to come. That's fantastic, Hans. And we'll obviously be watching watching your next steps very closely. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners, listeners today as you bid farewell? Well, perhaps, you know, the, the people who uh, are, are listening to this podcast are obviously belong to the community of stakeholders who follow our work very closely. And I would really like to thank them for uh, their support. I, you know, I also did that in, in, in my uh, farewell words at, at the last board meeting. Without our stakeholders around the world, we could simply could not do our work uh, because we are very, we have very, very smart staff and, 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 and board members, but they cannot obviously predict all the effects of our standards on the complex reality, the complex economic reality that we are dealing with. So to really get a good feel for our standards and where they are perhaps too costly or impossible, we need the feedback from our stakeholders and they do so and, and, and do so very diligently. They spent a lot of time in engaging uh, with us uh, and that's what we need and that's what I'm very grateful for. Thank you, Hans. And on behalf of the communications team and certainly the wider foundation audience, um, just thank you for your service over the past 10 years. Um, we will miss you and we wish you the very best on the next leg of your journey. Um, Sue, I don't know, do you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, what an opportunity. 
I'll add my thanks. Um, Hans has been a great boss. I think anybody who knows us and watches our work know that Hans and I have been a very close team, and that's been a lot of fun um, during my term, as particularly as vice chair. Um, but even when I was on the staff, I really enjoyed working with Hans as well. Um, and also, I think thank you on behalf of um, you know the foundation. I think Hans has been a fantastic chair for the the board for a couple of primary reasons in my mind. Once uh, one is that. I think our stakeholders around the world just know that Hans really enjoys visiting them. He's interested in what they've got to say and that warmth comes across. And I think that's been fantastic for us as an organization. And also I think the other big benefit of Hans was he wasn't an accountant. And so he's managed to really make us um, change our image. I think we're not so much seen, I hope, as being people who just care about debits and credits. I think we've really been repositioned largely due to Hans's work as an organisation that really matters for the efficiency of capital markets. And I think having a non-accountant as our chair helped us achieve that. So a big thank you from me, Hans. It's been fun. Thanks, Sue. And thank you both for joining me today. Um, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. You will find all past episodes of this and our other podcasts on our website, on our YouTube channel, Spotify, or your podcast player. If you have any comments or suggestions for the podcast itself, please email me on communications at ifrs.org. And until next time, keep well.